thanks to all three of you um, for three wonderful presentations that I think all resonated very well. Um, I think the first thing that I would maybe like to start out with, also coming from what Zadomi just presented, um, what fascinates me about your work is how you, um, in, in this m kind of trying to make all the phenomenological foundations of sound that you've also laid in, uh, laid out in your work, kind of make it useful, bringing it into politics, making this, um, taking it kind of to this to this next level. And um, I would like to invite you to, to maybe also, or even also, if you, if you still want to reflect on that, um, to kind of reflect on this work that you're doing, the artistic and the theoretical work, in bringing a notion of sound, and in her case, a very phenomenological notion of sound. In your case, maybe a much more a notion that comes much more from uh, the materiality of the field recording, um, these different notions of sound that you're coming in with to bring that into a space, to share it with other people and to make something happen in this kind of political or social realm, this engaged realm that you're working in. Um, I don't know, maybe if, if you still want to reflect on that to begin with and then have the others comment on it. Yes, I mean, I can only say yes. I think there is something that, I, I, I like a, in the end, it is very clear. Sound is not just benign and wonderful and will bring us all the solutions, as we saw um, with, with both Severine and, and, and Juliet's presentation. No sound can be very um, malevolent and very, very can be abused, can be used against us. But I think it has the potential, and I think that's the excitement for me, this kind of, that it can make us rethink what we think we know visually and can make us look at things differently. And then maybe we also find counteractions against the control that it's at least institutionally and governmentally has been has been um, used used for a lot. And I thought it was really interesting how the gender was used, um, um, Juliette, in your, in, in your examples, how apparently a, 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 a female voice is going to get us to the enchanted space. I thought that was very funny. Severine, or, or, yeah, do you want to? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, what, what, what I can say about this very question about um, the uh, interaction between the phenomenal, phenomenological and the political is, uh, the first, the funny thing, or funny I might say, is that um, I came to sound uh, through the radio, through a community radio, and uh, so sound was, uh, at first for me, really a tool of uh, curiosity, um, discovery, uh, something very positive, and uh, a tool of uh, expression. And uh, as I was working in this radio, I started to, uh, to work as an independent researcher on sound, but more precisely on the... Uh, uh, the um, what now I would call the uh, behaviorist uh, uses of sound um, and the negative uses of sound as a weapon uh, or as a uh, marketing tool. And um, but sound is still very. Um, I uh, keep. I mean, it, it resonates with with uh, Salome and uh, and Severin's uh, presentations because sound is. Uh, I'm uh, something uh, incurably positive to me, so I'm I'm always uh, surprised, you know, when someone uses it as uh, a weapon, in fact, or uh, as something uh, to manipulate you, uh, whether the manipulation does work or does not work, because I find in many instances it does not work, but it says it works and it is efficient in the uh, discourse about this manipulation and not the manipulation itself. And um, so that's why I uh, really wanted to um, analyze all this, and um, uh, because it's always a sort of um, extraordinary surprise to me that uh, sound can be something else than uh, an emancipation tool. Um, and uh, so dissecting the uh, uh, repressive uh, or uh, Advertising uses of sound is uh, sort of regiving it its emancipation power uh, through 
uh, in sort of uh, destructive analysis of possible negative uses of sound. And to just hear you say that um, base, you're, you're even questioning the effectiveness of these methods that you've described to us. Yes, or definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, not the um, not the uh, the physical physical one. The the last one we've uh, heard, the air rat and the grenades, they do work, uh, but precisely because they act, uh, they they threaten to deafen you, mm -hmm. and um, that's uh, in, indeed very effective. But the first one, uh, the um, the music, uh, background music and stuff like that, there's a, there are a lot of uh, phantasmas about this, and uh, but it, to me, it does not act. What the sound or the music does not act where it is claiming to act. In fact, when someone uh, sells background music or makes background music or broadcasts background music, they always say that music has a sort of magical power to uh, make people buy more or go uh, to uh, or eat more rapidly or more slowly according to the person who buys the music uh, interests um, but in fact it's not there it does not act there uh, the the music it's like the best example i can give you is a, um, an experiment that was made a few years ago two uh, groups of people uh, were uh, were um, watching the same film. Uh, it was a film about dolphins. Uh, no, about sharks, precisely, about sharks. A, film, a, sh a short documentary film about sharks. And the first group um, was given the traditional uh, shark music, uh, like, um, uh, what's the English name, uh, Jaws, I think, the horror film about uh, well, sharks eating people in the, uh, in the sea. And um, at the end of, um, of, the, uh, of, of the film, uh, this first group was asked, well, what, uh, how would you define the shark as an animal? And uh, well, the shark was described as being an aggressive uh, predator and uh, very evil and uh, very uh, hypocritical, I don't know what. The second group was given the same film but with the traditional dolphin music. So, you know, like the new world is opening and uh, that kind of music. And uh, they were asked um, what they to describe the, the shark. And the shark was, uh, well, described as a very powerful animal, as a very athletic and uh, even graceful animal. And uh, obviously, the music had been dictating the people what how they should describe the shark and it was not conscious is it manipulation i wouldn't uh, call that manipulation because as long as well, when you are aware that you, the music is in fact um delivering a speech uh, de delivering its own interpretation of uh, the picture that you're watching uh, you very quickly um uh, you can uh, uh, very quickly understand it. The thing is, uh, if you are not given this uh, clue that music is delivering a speech, if you go into uh, a specific um, uh, cafe and you have uh, very ha very um, tonic music, uh, you will understand quite unconsciously that it is a place for young people or a place where you're supposed to be happy and everything's uh, supposed to be fine. And um, it's just that you don't formally express it, but uh, if you, and you never take the time to analyze it, but if you take the time to just listen to the music, that, that's in fact the best uh, resistance that I have to background music. I really like to listen to it and to understand what people want us to uh, feel about this place and to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, Open the uh, open the background, open like opening, uh, um, uh, looking looking at the motor of t of things. Um, so no, I don't think the manipulation acts where it is supposed where it, where it says it acts because it's, it has nothing magical. Um, either it is physiologically uh, aggressive, <coughs> and it is very efficient in that way, or it is um, delivering some form of um, speech 
on what you're supposed to feel. But, you know, it's like, am I manipulating you if I'm telling you, be happy, be happy, be happy, be happy? No, I'm, I, I am not. I'm just delivering the speech about what I want you to, to feel. And it's very different. Severin, is it in some form the, um, the, the task or the mission of the BNA to kind of provide the empirical material to investigate these processes, to kind of look into, and in what ways are you doing this? Are you using, how are you working with the materials that you're gathering to maybe find out what new, um, yeah, kind of manipulatory forms are, are available or how just the, the cityscape, the sonic cityscape is changing and uh, what that does to people? Is there a way that you're working on that with those all those materials that you're accumulating? Um, no, uh, uh, first for, for to respond to your first mm -hmm. question, uh, um, uh, we pause and uh, we use the sound as uh, historical, political, cultural uh, material stuff, but it's closely uh, connect with uh, the phenomenological, phenomenological um, condition of the sound, which is uh, very specific because it's just like uh, the skin. It's uh, uh, the, the the border between inside and outside, and it can be very intimate, but also it's really collective and political. And uh, the phenomenological uh, condition of the sound is uh, uh, a chance for <laughs> for 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 history for oral history and sound history and sound memory because um, to, um, to, to, to speak is to, uh, to, to, to cause an impact uh, on, on the environment and to, to record the voice, to speak, is to let uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, react. So it's really uh, a potential. It's uh, it's in that way that we also use the concept of potential history. So all the stories um, can make a potential history, and always different, because the repetition makes the difference. Um, and uh, how we use all the, the the conversations and the soundscapes? No, it's more. It's just as I said. It's an experiment. So it's. It's a very subjective and, and organic uh, experiment. And um, it's freely available also, so the public can use uh, our sound and uh, the words. Uh, and we more use it to firstly make a, uh, a different history of the city to complete uh, an institu institutional uh, history. But also to 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 empower is is uh, this the life of the sound, so to to let it uh, live here and be in the city, so it's more organic, I would say. Um, concerning this life in the city, that's um, something maybe also just one more attempt also to bring to bring all of your perspectives together on the under the heading of that this. Um, this panel that was to uh, causing impact, um, which is of course an interesting way of, of formulating things. Impact is a notion that uh, has been um, used a lot very positively for socially engaged art, but also has been abused in, in this rhetoric of valorization. And then think impact is something that is measured uh, in many art and, and economic projects. Um, is that uh, I would just be curious to learn what, what if, if that's a, a notion you're at all comfortable with or you would rather like to reject and what then what, what would it mean for you to have impact or to cause impact? I, d I mean I, I wouldn't say for me to have impact because the problem is this kind of oh, for me to have impact it reminds me of application forms for money and you have to kind of prove what impact you are going to make in the world and I think that itself is actually too grand for sound because what I really like about sound is that the, if there is any impact it's about the, the exact opposite of an egocentric drive it's about this interbeing and being together and having a shared cosmos and really understanding that the hierarchies that we have are visual hierarchies and I don't mean this in an essentialist way I mean this in a cultural visuality way where it's I think we could look very differently and we could see very different things, but the way our eye is trained, and it's really an entrainment and a pedagogy, is uh, seeks for difference 
absolute difference in hierarchies. And therefore, there is this idea that one person can make this impact if we just give her £500,000 and she'll have, you know, changed the world. And of course, that's not going to happen. But I think what sound can invite um, is, is the kind of the participatory and the collective and to try to do things together and to make aware of a city like Brussels in a, in a different way. Maybe if I lived here and you walk through these streets and then you can listen on your map and, and that you start to understand that at this very same time, other people walk through this street as well. They're using it a certain way. I'm using it a way and yet it looks the same, but it clearly isn't. And so I think it has a lot to do also with um, pedagogy. And, and and how we learn to listen and therefore how we learn to be part of shared spaces through the invisible and the indivisible. And and, and I got quite scared in, in, in Juliette in your uh, presentation because I realized all the people who design are men. You know, they're again white men. So the chair designers are men, most architects are men. And you sort of think, well, sound can bring a different era, a different impact. And here we have again that kind of very small group who is designing how we're hearing and how and therefore how we see as well. Because I actually maybe our opinions differ, but I feel enchanted, you know, the SNCF sound particularly. I always feel I'm your but the trains will run here. You know, it's kind of it's it's th there is something in that sound that really triggers something. And I know, I know, but then I also feel and so I think we need to be much more savvy and I've gone completely off track. But I think the impact is has to be a social and a shared impact making, which means, yeah, maybe in schools already listening as a, as a, as a curriculum item that has not to do with music and it has not to do with the right listening to the teacher, but something, something else. So we get this sonic intelligence of knowing, oh, they're trying to manipulate me here. You know, and we can then start to compose and be part and see our voice and our footsteps as part of the design of a city and, and feel empowered to go and sing um, that song that boy did um, or you know the uh, yeah I, I wouldn't use it uh, to me impact is uh, in fact to to keep on with what Salome is saying uh, something very uh, uh, masculine or warrior like and um, I'm not a uh, I, I try to work uh, quite on the opposite. Um, I, I was um, I'm, I'm reading right now a book that has uh, recently been published in uh, in France. It's a collection of uh, Max Nohaus uh, uh, writings and talks, and um, he's describing always his uh, sound uh, installations or sound performances because it's quite uh, difficult to describe as you know something that you might miss and uh, um, always the sound that he creates uh, you have to pay attention to notice the sound uh, in the first place and then when you've noticed it you sort of enter in a in a new space I mean the space the space is being transformed by the perception of uh, that simple sound and um, and uh, he wants people, so so he doesn't uh, dictate anything on people. And uh, I, I um, I'd like to um, consider my work in the same way. I don't want. Uh, it has been, uh, in fact, um, uh, re reproached. I don't know, um, reproached. I, I don't know if the term is good. Oh yeah, I've been criticized by this by uh, uh, for this uh, by. Uh, um, a writer that I know, he told me, "Well, in uh, in in your books, you don't, uh, we don't know what you think, and uh, we don't, and you don't tell people what to do." I said, "Well, yes, <laughs> obviously, I wouldn't want to tell people what to do, and if you don't know what I think after reading my book, well, maybe you haven't read them because I try to give clues to people, to give tools to people, to uh, tackle the uh, auditory world we live in." Um, and uh, I think that uh, the, the, my irony or my position is perceptible in my uh, in my work. Yet I do not try to impose it on people, and certainly not to say we are all going into that direction. Please follow me. And that's uh, well, that's not at all the uh, impact precisely that uh, I'm trying to um, to have, but rather that uh, you know that to have that. Uh, uh, Neuhaus approach uh, to say, well, 
I hope that a few words or a few sounds or the way that I've expressed things uh, today or in, uh, in my books will make you uh, have a slightly different perception of uh, your daily, uh, daily world. And then, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, le chemin, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the path is all yours. I mean, I'm not going to, to, ra to, to, to walk along that path, uh, that, um, path instead of you. And uh, I couldn't imagine your path. But uh, it's just, you know, a slight shift in perception, very, uh, very small one, but that I believe can change things. Thank you. Severine, something you yeah. want to add from the BNR perspective? Yes, yes, of course, causing impact, it's, it's uh, very important for, for me and for us, because uh, indeed what we are making collectively is, is uh, to try to 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 make another history, and uh, we, uh, I, I personally uh, believe uh, that uh, to speak is to act, and um, there is also a um, spatial temporal complexity in the what I, what I, I I do with my work because I I really uh, feel that what I do is not only for the present but but. Uh, also for the future, and um, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's uh, an urgency. So maybe at this point, I want to open up uh, the podium for questions from the audience. We already have one <laughs> burning up there. Oh, that's great. Um, so I thought it's a great combination. And so I, I've been wondering, in a certain way, I read the, or I listen or I sense the recordings of uh, Juliette. Or in a certain way, if Severin is the center, as in the, in the talks, so in a certain way, I just heard all as a field recording. And then I, I, I was thinking, all the sounds played by Juliette are kind of a field recording for the people on the public space, which is always a cultural space. And so in a certain way, it's very much about domestication or pacification. Uh, but in a certain way, uh, I feel, let's say, if you think about what you, <laughs> Salome, your last uh, LP, the little piece you played, in a certain way, we could, we could feel like that's also a field recording for domestication or solification, but for another class. Let's say for the, for the people as we are that live in the clouds of the art. And of course, we want to have an impact, but we want to have an impact very in a very nice manner. Um, so, if we, it, because in a certain way, what what strikes me is that that we almost uh, blame these male people, whom I don't defend, of course, that do sound design. But in a certain way, if I try to analyze the sound you played, it has been played in a church highly uh, framed, highly cultural, powerful place by an organ. There were long sounds. There were harmonies that we recognized for centuries. And so in a certain way, if I try to reframe my position, uh, which is always difficult. I mean, I just have my view. But just I try to In a certain way, from another perspective, we could almost say that the Musak sound and a certain kind of uh, sound art is all just part of sound art. It's just, I felt it's uh, Juliet's files were all kind of the same sound art, but for other classes. And so that's, 
I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm sorry to, for, to laugh, and I found it really interesting. The center of the whole thing for me was this little Allah, which in a certain way, in, in Schulet's talk, you feel the, 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 the analysis of making us clear what the sound design, sound art is. And in your way, it's the idealism of what might be possible in our great, nice world of uh, artists. And in a certain way, there was like a moment, this little Allah, which is nice for us because we can enjoy the difference for once, the innocent difference, because we need so much to enjoy it, because it's the only thing we have to justify in a certain way what we want to do. I mean, if I can just pick up on, on What's a point that's really dear to me to make clear. When I say I was slightly worried that the sound designer were, I think, exclusively, in fact, unless I've misheard, male and presumably white male on the whole. I do make a clear difference in my thinking and in my writing uh, with, uh, between male, female and masculinity, femininity. And I very much follow Ellen Cizou in her differentiation and hence the last quote. On, on a masculine, say, let's say, agency in the world and a feminine agency of the world, and that does not, uh, that's not equal to the gender, the physiological gender of the person uh, being that agent. But the difference is the kind of the issue of the revenue, the issue of what comes back, and maybe that's why the word impact is so important to me, that I think I don't really search for impact as for um, agitation and I think these are two different words and they're quite decidedly different because impact means I gain revenue, agitation means something happens in the world and I think that's, that's what's very different to me and very important and I think I'm allowed to feel disappointed to say the least that you know the way things are designed, a church organ hence its harmonies, its possibilities, the music canon of church organ making is designed in a white, in, in the Western world, it is in a white male aesthetic, or a masculine white aesthetic. And of course for me, one of the, one of the excitements about sound is this ability to sneak in another voice, you know, to make the margin sound, not to sound louder than the center, but to kind of sound together and, and, and complexify, maybe dissolve the center altogether and bring everybody onto the margins, which is, I think is a far more exciting place. But I still have that infrastructure of the church organ, or rather, um, Aino Dwyer has the infrastructure of the church organ. But what she does is, she goes to this church and she has the recording session when all the cleaners are doing their work. I don't know whether she does that because she hasn't got the money to rent the church outright and has to go in when it's available, which is itself, you know, can be a sort of feminine DIY aesthetic economy. Of, of practice, or because, or maybe also because from that um, economical necessity then comes an aesthetic and a conceptual thinking of, well, actually that is good. That is good, because funny enough, I, I, I find churches are, you can say, you know, traditionally, um, if, you, if you bring class into it, yes, they, they, they are expensive to build and, and represent some sort of um, in England, Church of England or Catholic Church's money. But actually, a lot of people who go to church aren't moneyed at all, not at all. Um, um, and I think it's more complex, but I think I am entitled as a woman sound maker feminist, entitled to be a bit upset, if not a lot upset, that there is this invisible field, that there is this other material. We could make the world sound different in order for us to see a more complex plural world, not only, you know, diversity, male, female, masculine, feminine, but more plural on the whole. And yet again, the field's already taken, the sound's already done from that very same voice. I mean, you know, if that can't make me upset, I don't know what can. I think I'm entitled to. Yeah, I mean, I did not want to attack you especially. I mean, <laughs> sorry. I mean, uh, of course I understand. But in a certain way for me the question is that uh, this, this, the sound art of, of the policing 
watch uh, in a certain way. Juliet showed us. In a certain way, I can't forget to find it also in what we are doing in a certain way. That's my point. So in a certain way, I completely agree what you say. But why again a church? And it's not, it's not because of this specific uh, example. It's just as a thought. You mean why? Why again the church? Who was built by men? Who is ruled so by what, men? So what on earth was not built by men? Tell me that and I go and make some sound work there. Just go out. Just go out. Where? The street? The that was designed by men. Of course. But you don't reproduce it here. I mean, maybe, maybe that's where, you know, an Afrofuturism comes into. We just simply have to go into the future and work backwards because mm -hmm. clearly there is no, no space. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go that way. I think the church is a fine place to go and do sound work in in order to exactly dismantle its own hierarchies, the musical mm -hmm. hierarchies, the religious hierarchies, the architectural hierarchies. Yes, I, I, see, I see this point as well. I mean, it's... As I said, it's just as a thought. I, I'm not interested in a certain way to hear you defending. I'm not <laughs> it's defending, in a certain way I'm just telling you all. It's, it's in a certain way the thought that um, what, the, what, what do these spaces tell us? Because it's not only the church. It's again, it's th the organ in the church. Well, I shouldn't be in here then. I shouldn't make a sound in a lecture theatre because that is absolutely a masculine space. Yes, on that note, on that note, maybe uh, we'll give room for one. We have time for one more question. If there is another question, yes, please. Oh, there's a lot of cable. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Partly a question and partly a statement uh, while doing theater with this mic. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you all three so much for your presentations. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start with a statement. I'll just say that maybe, you know, what's kind of remained very much after the three presentations and, and after the talk here um, was just this idea that, you know, at times where sound is is instrumentalized in dominant ways to repel and alienate uh, perhaps you know a very significant political statement to make is to use sound in ways to approach and intimate um and i find that this is exactly how sort of you know feminism and, and sonic practices kind of intertwine so in a way that was very very clearly demonstrated especially you know in the in the final sort of presentation um but of course, there's there's this question of positionality, I suppose. So I guess, you know, when sound is being used to intimate uh, by dominant practices, then we find it sometimes, you know, very, very alienating. So for instance, you know, the comforting voice uh, that signals intimacy, you know, if it's done in a way that is kind of top down, trickling down, and you cannot really engage with it in other ways other than obeying it, then it's something very different than the comforting voice that emerges from, say, two people improvising together spontaneously and in a place where they shouldn't. Um, so I, I, I suppose a, a question that I have is, and, I, and it goes for all three speakers, um, is how do we negotiate positionality? Um, in, in cases like this, like the conversation that just happened, where, you know, for me, uh, Anya O'Dwyer's work is, is so interesting because she's entering a space almost like in hiding, you know? She's, she's playing in the church in a way that is not a concert, so she's not kind of focusing attention on herself, but quite the opposite. Uh, and I have stories about that that I can... Uh, talk about later but <laughs> but how do we um negotiate you know this this position of who is speaking or who is making an utterance and who is being instrumentalized that's a kind of open question and you know i, I suppose i would really like to hear something about that from everyone <laughs> thanks I think it's very difficult 
you know, because I, I realize, you know, that they, when somebody's speaking, there's always somebody not speaking automatically, or many people not speaking. And, and while I sort of um, feel, you know, th uh, an issue of feminism has been very loud, the issue of race uh, or creed hasn't been as loud, but to me it's implicit in a notion of plurality that, that I know that this, this realization that there are the margins, sort of the, the invigoration and the listening to the margins is to really to the inaudible, to unheard voices in general, and to just get rid of the center so that a lot more can be heard. So positionality, as, as I understand it, and I don't know whether we understand it the same, becomes for me very important. And yet again, it's a feminine practice of a positionality that always understands that as soon as you speak, somebody else doesn't. And, and a humility, I guess, a, and a responsibility to that position of speaking, that within what you say, you're, sp you're not speaking for, but you're at the same time listening for what's not being said all the time, and so that it can be readdressed in every new um, incarnation, in every new production, or in, in curatorial concerns, or in publishing concerns, or whatever they might be, however we interact. Um, so I, I, un I totally see that as, a, as a, not a solvable, but a practicable issue, um, I guess. It's indeed difficult, but um, as I as I try to to show, uh, we have a lot of methodology, and so we record a lot of conversations. So people are exchange words, and they speak uh, together. Uh, and also, we try to don't uh, have an exotic relation to some topic topics, but we dispatch microphone and so people can record themselves or, or anyone they want so we don't uh, we, we try to to um, uh, dejoui, uh, to to no 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 to 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 avoid the the the, the power relation so but it's a specific context here in VR. That's not uh, the same. Um, uh, positionality, if I understand, is uh, the fact that you're involved in your work and uh, it is that uh, you wanted to say. Um. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, I mean, in a way, maybe Salome also kind of evoked that as well, just from which position one speaks yeah, and okay. therefore how that influences yeah. uh, you know how what is being heard and what is being silenced in a way well from uh, from where i speak is also from where i listen and uh, and also from where uh, i just live and uh, the fact that uh, i am a woman uh, that that put me in a certain position uh, regarding the sounds and that I'm analyzing, which is, in fact, mainly uh, masculine sounds, or uh, masculine or capitalist. Uh, uh, maybe there are some equivalencies there. That, <laughs> um, and um, I'm also a white woman, so I think that uh, uh, being a woman gives me a position of outsider. Being white gives me some sort of automatic legitimacy that other women wouldn't have or other persons that uh, don't define themselves as women or men. And, uh, well, I am standing from that position, uh, which is a sort of... Uh, I am giving myself my own legitimacy to uh, first to um, uh, analyze what I'm analyzing and to say that it is, in fact, a new research field and I, it took time to, uh, for me to understand that I was defining a new re research field and, um, and to um, assert myself as that. And uh, my, um, uh, my uh, uh, political uh, or and social uh, involvements uh, cannot be separated from, uh, from my uh, independent uh, research work because it is like, you know, like uh, uh, cutting a piece of your ear, you know, trying to uh, just take part of the sound and not the whole sound, I mean, it would be completely absurd. 
and um, and it may I, I don't know uh, to me there's an echo uh, regarding this uh, um, conversation about the uh, the the record uh, in the church. Uh, to me, the the uh, legitimacy to uh, for a woman or any minority to go anywhere uh, she uh, or he wants uh, is uh, not questionable, and. Uh, furthermore, the, the record in the church to me uh, brought up something else, which is uh, during the uh, Notre Dame fire that uh, happened just uh, uh, last week, I, um, uh, somebody, um, uh, somebody uh, uh, said that, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the history of, uh, of uh, uh, women uh, workers uh, in uh, the medieval ages or later uh, is not uh, void. I mean, it, it is simply not known. And in fact, when this woman uh, does the, uh, goes and records in the church and plays in the church uh, in that way, to me, it's sort of, a, of an echo also uh, of a new audibility to a, to a hidden uh, or unheard uh, history of women presence in the churches and in any um, uh, place um, uh, associated to uh, masculine power. And uh, to me, it's very interesting. It's like, uh, you know, raising the, 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 the ghosts of, uh, uh, of people that had been uh, hidden there, and they suddenly uh, uh, have their own voice in that place. Finishing on female ghosts uh, for this morning.